Okay, uh, we'll get started. Uh, thanks for being here. Week three, Wednesday. Uh, I have a couple. So I have, mid, I've got this file, midterm one topics. So we'll uh, we'll discuss that. And then I also have today's lecture. And then I also want to talk a little bit. I don't, I don't know if you guys have heard about the potential lecture strike. Is this? Have you guys ever heard of it? Okay, so. Um, let me, let me just tell you a little bit about, uh, so the job I have is technically not professor, it is lecturer, okay? And so, I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but at UCLA and all of the UCs, there are two tiers of faculty. There are tenure track professors and there are lecturers. The tenure track professors, they do the cutting edge research, they do grants and they, they bring in a lot of uh, money and stuff to the school. So they do research and they teach. Uh, lecturers like me, um, and I think a lot of the classes you've taken, at least in the statistics department, um, are taught by lecturers. So myself, I'm a lecturer, Professor Tseng, Professor Liu, Professor Christo, uh, Professor Sanchez, uh, Professor Almohawas. We, we're all lecturers, okay? Professor Zanontian. So, uh, so the statistics department um, actually takes very good care of us lectures. So anyway, so, so there's, a, there's a different system, right? You've got tenure track professors who do research, you have lecturers who only teach. And, um, and as far as the statistics department goes, uh, the statistics department has been very generous and very kind to the lectures. They treat us well, they kind of promised uh, you know, it, as, as in, it's informal, but they've, they've promised us job security and saying kind of like, you know, we've hired you and we'll hire you again and, and we're not going to fire you type of thing. But that, uh, the generosity to the lectures is not a universal thing across, uh, even across the university uh, at UCLA. So if you go to a different department, You'll, have, you'll still have kind of this tenure track professors versus lecturers thing, but um, as it stands right now, the lecturers are hired on a, a one-year contract. And, and we're actually, for the first six years of our career, we're hired on a year-by-year -year basis. And basically, the, whichever department is hiring the lecturer, they can just say, you know what, we don't feel like renewing your contract, and then, and then you're out of a job. It's it, it's a little bit like getting cut or you know being released from a, a team or something. And so, um, so I'm uh, the lecturers were represented by a union, and so the union is trying to change the way uh, kind of this system works in that you know they kind of want multi-year contracts rather than just one year at a time and you have to technically i had to reapply for my job every single year for the past six years and actually just this past year i just got promoted to continuing lecture status where i don't have to go through this reapplication process every single year um, which was very nice uh, thank you thank you <laughs> but technically for the first six years i had to reapply for my own job um, every single year which seems a little silly, but th that was just kind of the system. But thankfully, the statistics department, they told me, you know, I know you have to reapply, but don't worry about it. We're still, we're going to hire you again next year. But again, that's not kind of how it works across all departments. And so in some other departments, some of the lectures, they have to reapply for their job. And then the department's just like, uh, sorry, we don't want, we don't want you. We're going to hire someone else. And it kind of it kind of sucks because, uh, well, you know, um, you, you lose a lot of job security, and so uh, in, in those systems, the lecturers always kind of have maybe like one foot out of the door because they're not quite sure if they're going to get rehired, so they're kind of looking around at the same time. And and a lot of you being fourth years know kind of the uh, how draining it can be having to search for another job. Uh, while doing everything else. So that's that's the reality that exists for a lot of other lecturers across the university. And so the un uh, union is trying to uh, 
to fight to change that. Um, and they're working, trying to work out contracts, a new kind of contract that, um, that changes that process. And, uh, and we've kind of reached a stalemate. Um, we can't really get an agreement between the universities, policy makers, and the union. And so, um, so there's going to be, there's like a picket uh, that, that's going on right now, uh, just right in front of Kirkhoff. Uh, I'll, I'll be joining after I teach this class. Uh, it's going to happen today and tomorrow. And so anyway, if you've heard about the strike, that's, that's basically what the union is fighting for. They're trying to fight so that lecturers don't have to go through this process of having to reapply for their job every single year, um, trying to get kind of multi-year contracts and things like that. Uh, and again, I'm very grateful to the statistics department who um, has been very, very kind, but um, you know, it shouldn't just be something that happens in the statistics department only, but you know, maybe across other departments too. Yeah. Is yeah. anyone actually on strike? So we're not um, we're not on strike yet. Okay. Hopefully, we don't want to go on strike. We want this contract worked out. You know, we want to kind of get this new system of like we don't have to apply for a job every single year and not know if we're going to get the job the following year. You know, we're trying to change the contract so that changes and and if we can get that worked out, we, we don't go on strike. But um, they've been negotiating for about a year and a half, two years now, um, tr trying to get this worked out. And basically, um, the union is threatening that if you're not willing to put this into writing, you know, instead of having just different departments on this informal system of, you know, you know, just verbally saying, we'll, we'll rehire you. Um, but put it in writing, um, then then they're threatening to strike. And so I don't want to strike. I enjoy teaching. I enjoy my job very much. Um, you know, and if we do strike, then it's like we're going to fall behind in content, and I'm like stressed out about that. But um, <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, I, I think it's something worth fighting for and something worth striking over. And so uh, we are prepared to do that. It, it hasn't happened yet. Hopefully, it doesn't come to that. But um, but we're just trying to raise awareness about kind of the situation uh, that's going on. So if you have any questions about that, I'm happy to answer your questions. But anyway, just wanted to thanks for listening to me uh, regarding that. OK, um, let's take a look at what I posted for midterm one topics. OK, so this is up on CCLE. So it's going to be, um, it's on Monday, right? I think that's what I put on the calendar. I'm like, um, confusing myself. Okay, so we'll just take it in here. I'm going to set up a seating chart. I know that's super weird, but I think all of your chairs are numbered. And so I will, um, I think, at, and at the edge of the row, there's like a letter. So I'll go through and I'll write down all the information about this classroom. And then I'll go home and I'll create a seating chart and I'll email this out. And, uh, and it'll say, you know, on Monday, you'll sit and seat, you know, C102 or something like that, okay? And so just, just be on the lookout for uh, an email with that. Um, and I know seating chart's a little bit weird, uh, but it has actually, I had to do this because there were a couple years where like a couple quarters in a row I caught instances of academic dishonesty and it was, it was kind of just because of like two friends were sitting next to each other and so after I've done the seating chart that um, I haven't had those issues so I use the seating chart now okay um, and you're allowed to uh, I don't want to say open note completely but you're allowed to have kind of two sheets of paper with notes I think that's going to be more than enough um, I just don't want somebody bringing in a huge stack of of things, I don't want you to just like print out all of the <laughs> slides, you know, hundreds of pages. I don't want that. And then, um, you know, I'm not comfortable letting you guys in with your iPads or tablets or something, or um, computers as kind of your source of notes. So, so we'll just say two sheets of notes, front and back, that's fine. Bring a calculator. Uh, any calculator is fine, just you can't use your phone, you can't use a tablet or computer, you know, anything that connects to the internet, something like that, okay? 
Um, and then these are the topics, okay? So 45 minutes, so this is always the challenge of writing an exam is guessing how long it will take for students to complete this exam. So I'm doing three problems and I think this is the approximately the right length. You want to make it about the right length. So hopefully this is this is it. Okay. Um, so one, you're going to do Bayesian inference with a conjugate prior. I'm, what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you a small sample of data that comes from some specified distribution. And the distribution will be one of these, okay, exponential, Poisson, binomial, negative binomial, or gamma. And if you've forgotten what these distributions look like, you know, take, take time this week to uh, familiarize yourself with them and how they work and, you know, what these parameters are, okay? So you should probably include those PDFs in your notes, okay? And then, um, and you'll find uh, the likelihood function for one of the parameters, okay, given the provided data. So kind of like, you know, uh, the example we did in class was the beta binomial. And so data is coming from the binomial and then you can create a likelihood function for your binomial data, a likelihood function for the unknown parameter beta, okay? I will also provide, what I will provide the conjugate prior distribution in the corresponding PDF. So, uh, so if it's, you know, if the data is coming from a binomial, I will provide the beta distribution, which would be the conjugate prior and the PDF of the beta distribution. Okay? So, um, so anyway, so I'll provide that conjugate prior. And what you will do is you'll use the data I give you along with the conjugate prior. You're going to figure out the posterior distribution. Okay, posterior distribution uh, for our kind of provided data. And, uh, and that, will, that will be it for that part, okay? It's, if you look at your homework, homework one, you know, you get something similar. There's some problem just like this, it's beta binomial, and it's just, it's probably gonna be something a little bit different, okay? And you got a few choices, exponential, Poisson binomial, negative binomial, and gamma. And then, um, and then you'll um, handwrite some R code, okay? And this is only just a few lines, okay? It's, so if you look at how many lines did you need to write to estimate, you know, I think the question was, uh, if this player uh, has three at-bats, what's the probability to get two hits? You know, how many lines of code did you have to write for that? Not very many, right? One, you had to create a random sample of values from the beta distribution, then you plug that into the function, and then you calculate the mean. Pretty much, that's about it. You're going to have to write a few lines of code kind of reflecting that you know how to get this estimate. Okay. All right, questions on that? Problem one? So I would say study your homework and then try it out for different, one of these different things, okay? Somebody wants to make some practice problems and put that on Campus Wire, go for it, okay? Um, problem number two, important sampling. All right, so you'll be asked to estimate the expected value of some function h applied to a random variable x, where x comes, has some PDF f, all right? And f is going to just, will be one of these, uniform beta exponential or gamma distributions, all right? Meanwhile, and so this is, you're going to do important sampling by hand, but in a kind of a laughably poor way. Uh, I'm going to provide a small sample of values, actual random values, probably rounded it down to a couple, like one or two decimal places, but some actual values sampled from a different probability distribution G. Okay, and I'll give you the PDF of G. Or at least I'll describe the PDF of G. Okay, and what you will do is you will use important sampling to estimate this original question, what's the expected value of the function h if it came from random variable x, okay? And, you know, in real life, we would probably take samples of 10,000 or 100,000 or 5,000 or whatever. Here, we're going to create an estimate based on five values, so this will not be a very good thing, but at least you'll have to demonstrate that you understand kind of how this works, okay? Shouldn't be too bad, okay? The last one is uh, the inverse CDF method, which 
we introduced on Monday, and we will cover a little bit more today. I will provide an arbitrary PDF. This PDF can be anything, all right? It's not necessarily going to be a, a standard PDF. Um, in today's lecture notes, I've got a piecewise PDF. Okay, be, you know, be prepared for something that could be piecewise. Be prepared for something that could be some strange shape, okay? It, all I will guarantee is that it will, there will be some way to write the function, okay? So there, there will be a functional equation. You'll have to find the CDF, okay? How do we find the CDF of a PDF? You basically take the integral of it, okay? Integral from negative infinity to x of the PDF dt, okay? So this might mean you need to, I don't know when the last time you did an integral, but uh, maybe you have to brush up on some integral rules, okay? And then, uh, and then you'll have to figure out how to invert that, that CDF. Okay, And then what I will do is I will provide some arbitrary values sampled from you, and then you will tell me what those values of u will produce what random values of x. Okay? Now I will tell you um, the integral will be doable. I'm not going to give you like the normal PDF, which has no closed form solution to the integral or something like that. Okay, so I think I think it'll be I think it'll be reasonable. I just just want to make sure you guys can do it. Okay, questions? And I think I think this will take forty five minutes. All right, and that gives us also five minutes to pass out papers and collect them. Okay, so that's Monday. And I'll send you guys a seating chart. Okay. And I'm sorry that the desks are tiny. Just do your best. Okay. Is that good? Any questions? All right. Okay. Wait. What am I doing? I don't want to. <laughs> Let's pull up these notes. Teaching inverse CDF convolutions. All right. Week three, Wednesday, today. All right, more inverse CDF stuff. All right, so the inverse CDF method, again, is, you know, we want to generate samples of x coming from some distribution, in this case the distribution is expressed as the CDF, F, right? And in order to do this, what we can do is we can take the inverse of the CDF. The inverse of the CDF is big F negative one, okay? That's the inverse function of F, okay? You're gonna, it's the value that can go inside of the inverse CDF has to be a value between zero and one, that's the domain of the inverse CDF. You cannot plug in any value outside of 0 or 1. It will fail. And so we indicate that by using the letter U. And we're going to generate a random value from the uniform distribution, somewhere, some value between 0 and 1. And all we say is that the random variable x is just your random value U plugged into the inverse CDF. Okay. The inverse CDF can be expressed this way. It's the basically the value of t, okay, such that f of t is greater than or equal to u, okay. So if it's if it's a one to one function, okay, then then f of t is just it's the value of t where f of t is equal to u, right? No problem there. But then we put in this min t business for kind of discrete distributions. So we'll see an example of that in a moment. But first, here's an example of 
a PDF that you won't see this example directly on your midterm exam, but you might see something kind of like this. I don't know. Okay. So here, what is this? It's the PDF. X can be a value between 0 and 2. The PDF from 0 to 1 is y equals, or f of x is equal to x. And then the PDF from 1 to 2 is 2 minus x. Okay, so you get this triangular distribution, right? So the value 1 is the most frequent value. Values near 1 are also common. Values at 2, getting exactly 2 is uncommon. Values getting exactly 0 is uncommon. Okay. What is a, is there a real life analog that you can think of? So this would be kind of like, I hope I can draw this. Oh, what's wrong with my pen? Okay, so here's a spinner. Okay, and this end is zero. And this end is one. Down here would be 0 0.5, 0 0.25, 0 0.75 uh, over here. Okay, and then we're gonna click it and it spins. Okay, so if it ends right over here, you get zero, and if it ends right over here, you get one. So this distribution is flick the thing twice and add up your numbers and you will get this triangular distribution okay because how many ways are there to get a sum of one well you can get 0 0.5 0 0.5 you can get 0 0.25 0 0.75 and basically like um, the first flip spin can be anything from zero to one and then and then there's something that kind of matches, okay? But then how do you, how can you get a sum that's two, okay? Well, you need to get exactly one and exactly one on both spins, which is, which is very unlikely, okay? How can you get a sum of, say, 1.5? Well, you, your first spin has to be at least 0.5, okay? Otherwise, you're not gonna get a sum of 1.5 and things like that. So this would be, this would be the, um, the distribution for the output of this. Okay, so anyway, let's say this is your PDF. Okay, what is the CDF of this? What is the CDF, okay? The first part's easy, right? You just integrate T from zero to X, I mean zero to one, right? Not zero, I'm sorry. For values of t less than 1, you integrate 0 to t, uh, 0 to x dt, okay? So we're going to go from 0 to x of f of t dt, right? So, so first we're going to do this, and it's just, as far as this goes, it's just t, okay? So this becomes t squared over 2 evaluated from 0 to x. If you plug in x, you get x squared over 2. You subtract off 0, and you get minus zero, you get x squared over two, and this is valid for values between zero to one. What do we do about the second piece? Okay, the second piece is two minus x. Okay, so we have to integrate, it's piecewise, so we're gonna go integrate from zero to x, f of t dt, and for anything where x is going to be greater than 1, we have to integrate from 0 to 1, t dt, and then from 1 to x of 2 minus t dt. Okay? So if we integrate this first part, we get t squared over 2 from 1 to 0. That evaluates to 1 half. Okay? So that makes sense, actually. The area going from here to here has an area of 1 half. So, so it's going to be 1 half plus this stuff, okay? 1 half plus this stuff. So here we have to integrate from 1 to x 
of 2 minus t dt, okay? So this becomes 2t minus t squared over 2 from 1 to x, okay? So if you evaluate it at x, you get 2x minus x squared over 2 minus, and then you evaluate it at 1, 2 minus 1 half. So now there's a whole bunch of, it's hard to keep track of all your plus and minus signs, okay? But 2 minus 1 half is negative 1 and a half. 1 half minus 1 and a half becomes a negative 1. And so here we get negative 1, 2x minus x squared. So this is the other piece of the CDF. Okay, is that all right? Getting, uh, getting this stuff, all right? Sometimes students, if I give you a piecewise thing, I've given piecewise problems in, the, in past midterms, students forget to do the zero to one part or the, the first piece. And then they start off with this thing and then it just doesn't work out because it doesn't add up to, it doesn't evaluate to one, right? You should do a quick check. Quick check, you should say, well, what is the CDF of two? The CDF of two, if that's the largest value that x can be, the CDF of two has to evaluate to one, right? So you can just kind of do a quick sanity check after this. If you plug in two here, you should get the value one. So you get negative one plus four minus t squared over two. So two, four, minus, four over two is two, so minus one plus four minus um, two, yeah, that, that, that equals one, okay? So it's a sanity check, we do get one when we evaluate that. All right, so now, now we have to find the inverse of f, okay? And we have to do this piecewise as well, right? This two is done piecewise. So first we say f of x is equal to u, we're gonna do this part, first part. x squared over two is equal to u, we get 0 is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to 1. And then we're going to solve for x in terms of u. So I multiply both sides by 2, and I take the square root, okay? All right, and technically, when you have x squared is equal to 2u, x could be plus or minus the square root of 2u, plus or minus. And sometimes you get the minus side, okay? So what we want is we want to make sure that x is greater than or equal to 0. So in that case, we're going to just keep the plus side of the square root, okay? And so we're going to say x is equal to the square root of 2u. That part's okay, and that's, this is for values of u between 0 and 1 half. Okay, and then over here, now we're evaluating for values of x between 1 and 2. We plug in the CDF that we calculated, which was negative 1 plus 2x minus x squared over 2. Okay, we set this equal to u, and we're going to solve for x in terms of u. How do we do this? Okay, this is, I think students forgot their algebra. Okay, you don't factor this. Okay, don't factor it into like something something. Okay, you gotta, you've got to get x all by itself. So I multiply both sides by 2. So I get, uh, I multiply both sides by negative two, all right? And then over on this side, how do I get x by itself? So students are tempted to try to like factor x out or something, and you need to do like x times four minus x or something like that, okay? That, that's, don't do that, right? What we have to do is uh, we're gonna complete the square, okay? Do you remember that? Okay, so it's, it's uh, in this case, if I do uh, x minus 2 squared or uh, 2 minus x squared, I would need to add a 4 here. I would, I'd need, I would need to have a 4 over here, so I need to add 2 to both sides. So I have this. I have 2 minus x quantity squared is equal to negative 2u plus 2. And then I take the square root, plus or minus. And again, we have to look at whether we want to keep the plus or minus side. We need to make sure x evaluates between 1 and 2. All right. Or x, x takes on values between 1 and 2, and so that means 2 minus 2 is 0, and 2 minus 1 is 1. And so we're going to just take, keep the positive side here. So we get 2 minus x is this. Solving for x, I get 2 minus this is equal to x. And that's it, okay? Here I can factor out 2 to 1 minus u here if I want, but this is what I get. All right, so solving, solving for x. Oh, I've completely forgotten about our view quiz answers, huh? 
Okay, uh, the first two, the first two are the letters D and A. D as in dog, A as in apple. D as in dog, A as in apple are your first two D quiz answers. I'm gonna run out of time. Okay. Any questions here? Working with this piecewise CDF. Okay, and so here I can say, let's generate a whole bunch of values of u. And so first, so that I'm gonna just say x is two times u. I could have done an if-else statement. There's lots of ways I could have done this, right? So one is I'm gonna do square root of two times u. That's, that's this side, x is square root of two times u. And that, that gives me, that works for here, but then if anything is for u is greater than 0.5, we got to switch over to this. Okay, for u greater than 0.5, so indicator, so we're going to just kind of subset all of the x values and replace those. So anything where this indicator u greater than 0.5 is true, I'm going to plug this in. Okay, 2 minus the square root of 2 minus, times 1 minus u. Now that I'm looking at this, I probably should have just done an if-else, okay? If-else, u greater than 0.5, or u less than 0.5, square root 2u, or 2 minus square root 2 times that. But that, that's only in a, kind of this type of thing, okay? And so if I do that, this is the resulting distribution, or the resulting histogram. We can overlay the theoretic density on top of that aligns quite nicely. Oh, and I thought I was I thought I had a CDF of the thing, empirical CDF plotted, but I guess not. Okay, well if you plot the empirical CDF, it looks good too. <laughs> okay. But I'll to indicate that indeed we have generated random values from this distribution that follows, you know, just some arbitrary distribution that I specified here. But again, it requires us to be able to integrate it to find the CDF and then find the inverse CDF, which, depending on what we have, is not always easy. Okay, let's talk about finding the inverse CDF if we have a discrete distribution. So let's say we have a discrete distribution and the probability mass function looks like this. You get the output 1 with probability 0.5, the output 2 with probability 0.4, the output 3 with probability 0.1. So this would be, we've got another game here. This gives me the output 1. I don't know what 10% is. Okay, and then again, we flip the spinner, okay? And where does it land? It lands in 1 50% of the time, it lands 2 40% of the time, it lands 3 10% of the time, okay? Or you could imagine some other... There's lots of ways we could design this thing, right? Two, okay, well, there's are supposed to be numbers in those balls, okay? So you can imagine a bag, 10 balls, and you're going to draw them with replacement. You know, half of them are one, four of them are two, one of them is a three, right? These are, these are ways you could have this random thing. Okay, what does the CDF look like? The CDF is a step function, okay? So... For values less than 1, the CDF is 0, okay? Remember, the probability, the CDF is the cumulative probability that your random variable x is less than or equal to some value x sub i, okay? So um, what's the probability you get a value less than 1? 0. What's the probability you get a value less than 1.2? 50%. What is the value, probability that you get a value less than 
50%. What's the probability you get a value less than 2? Still 50%, okay? Um, but then we ask, what's the probability you get a value less than 2.01? Okay, now that number is 90%, okay? So the probability that you get a value um, uh, less, than or, less than or equal to 2 is going to be 0.9, okay? And, uh, and anything kind of higher than that, so values between 2 and 3, less than 3, will evaluate 2.9. And then when you hit 3, then you get 1. And anything higher than 3 is going to evaluate to 1. So your cumulative distribution function looks like this, okay? What's the probability that the spinner What's the probability I get something less than 1, 0? What's the probability between 1 and 1 1.999, the cumulative distribution function that x is less than or equal to uh, x between 1 and 9.999, 1 1.999 is 50%, okay? And then evaluated from 2 to 2.999, the probability I get a value between 2 and 2.9999, that's going to be 90%. And at 3, it becomes 1. Right, so this is my CDF. The CDF of a CDF of a discrete distribution. Right. What happens if I try to invert this? Right? So normally when you take the inverse of a function, what do you do? You take it and then you flip it on the axis y equals x. Right? You, flip, you take the function and you flip it on the axis y equals x, that normally gives you your inverse function. Okay. Um, that doesn't work here. Because now we have these vertical lines, right? And so it doesn't, uh, it doesn't work with, uh, with vertical lines here. Okay, it's not, no longer, doesn't work. So then we use the minimum function, okay? So we ask something. If u is equal to 0.326, okay, we ask, what is the smallest value of t such that the CDF of t is going to be greater than or equal to u? Okay. So if u is 0.326, the smallest value of t such that the CDF of t evaluates to be something greater than 0.326 is t equal to 1, okay? At t equal to 1, the CDF is 0.5, okay? 0.5 is greater than 0.326, so we're good there, okay? Because we might think, well, if u is 0.326, you know, should I get 0? No. Our CDF, sh our, our distribution function never produces the value 0. The smallest value it produces is 1, okay? What do we do if u is 0.786? Okay, 0.786 is between here and here. It needs to produce 2, okay? Because at 2, the CDF evaluates to 0 0.9. 0 0.9 is greater than 0.786. Okay. Otherwise, we're going to get things. So, so our inverse CDF looks like this. It's, it's going to produce 1 if u comes in between 0 and 0.5. Right, because we ask, what's the smallest value of t that produces uh, the CDF such that it's greater, the evaluation of the CDF is greater than 1? Okay, what's the, uh, for values between 0.5 and 0.9, it's going to produce 2, and for values between 0.9 and 1, it will produce 3. And from looking at this, we can see, okay, it's going to produce 1 with probability 0.5, it's going to produce 2 with probability 0.4, it's going to produce 3 with probability 0.1. So, so this seems good and satisfactory. And that's it, okay? We generate values from the random uniform, and we're gonna just, you have to kind of set up a statement that will evaluate your values this way. Okay, so what if you have some arbitrary PMF, okay? You've got K possible outputs, 
All right, and the only re requirement is that the probabilities add up sum to one, right? The, the, the individual masses of the different k possible outcomes, they add up to one, okay? Okay, then the CDF, the cumulative distribution function, is zero for anything less than your first possible outcome, the lowest possible outcome. I guess this is un under the assumption, maybe I need to write x1 is less than x2, which is less than x n, which is less than xk. Okay, so it's the assumption that these are all in order from least to greatest. Okay, so anything less than x1 will happen with a probability zero. Anything where x is greater than your last value, x sub k, is going to equal one. Okay, and anything in between is the sum of those values up to that point. Okay, so from the values between the first two, something greater than x1 but less than x2 happens with probability point p1. Values between x2 and x3 happens with probability p1 plus p2, so on and so forth, until you get to the values between the j and the j plus 1 observation is going to be the sum uh, from k equal 1 to j. It's going to be uh, sum from k equal 1 to j, and then lastly, you're going to, um, the last one, if you sum them all up, you're going to get 1. Okay. Then the inverse CDF is we're going to say, well, if u comes in less than p1, less than or equal to p1, it should produce x1. If u comes in between p1 and p1 plus p2, then it should produce x2. If u comes in between, say, the sum of j minus 1 to the sum of pk through j, then it will produce x sub j. And then if u comes in greater than uh, everything added up to the second to the last one, from 1 to k minus 1, then it will produce the last value. Okay? And that, that will give you uh, your answers there. Okay? And so this, this will generate generalize to any, any function with a probability mass function. So this is probably, <laughs> I made this overly complicated, but this will work for any arbitrary probability mass function. So if you get a vector of the outcomes, vector of outcomes, here I just have the outcomes 1, 2, and 3, and the vector of probabilities with the rule that the probabilities must sum to 1, 0 0.5, 0 0.4, 0 0.1, we can say, we can generate, um, we can generate uh, a bunch of these values, okay? Or, or this will be a function that will generate uh, an instance of this. So it's going to generate one random uniform value. And starting at position one, what it's going to do is it's going to just check, is u greater than the sum of the cumulative probabilities here. Okay, so it says take the probabilities from one through the position. Okay, so starting at position one. So maybe I should have a check to make sure you, that the probability vector is not empty. Okay, but starting at the first position, okay, take the sum of all of those kind of cumulative things and whatever it is. Um, and if, uh, as soon as this becomes no longer true, or if it, if it is true, add 1 to the position, and if it's not, then print out the x position, okay? So let's just kind of talk through what happens. Let's say the random value I sample is 0.2. If the random u I sample is 0.2, the value I should print out would be 1, right? Because values between 0 and 0.5 should produce 1. Okay, so if it's 0.2, if u is 0.2, I say, well, u is greater than the sum of the probabilities from 1 through the position. Okay, so 1 through 1 gives me 0.5. Is 0.2 greater than 0.5? No, so it's not going to run this loop. It's not going to run the code inside the while loop. And it just exits out right away. And so my Position starts off at 1, and it's going to return x um, in the first position, which is 1. Okay. Let's say u is uh, 0.7. Let's 
let's say u is 0.7. Well, if it's 0.7, because it's between 0.5 and 0.9, it should produce the value 2. So at 0.7, we'll say, while u is greater than the sum of the first whatever, 1 through whatever positions, okay, so it starts off at position 1, 0.7 is greater than 0.5, so it's going to increment the position to 2, okay? It increments the position to 2, now the sum is 0.9, the loop is no longer true, the while statement is no longer true, so it's going to, at 0.7, it's going to output 2, okay? And if we get something like 0.99, then it checks 0.5, it, it's u is greater than 0.5, it looks at the next one, 0.5 plus 0.4 is 0.9, u is greater than 0.9, so it increments to position 3. At position 3, this sums up to 1, u is going to be less than that, so it returns position 3. Okay? So just a few examples. The first value it sampled was 0.2, it produces 1. The next value at sample is 0.685, so it returns 2. The next value at samples is 0.916, and so it produces the value 3. And if I do a, um, if I produce this random underscore discrete, okay, we get a whole bunch of values here, okay? And actually, the function sample already has this ability to draw values from a discrete distribution, right? So you can do sample. Sample, um, we can say values 1, 2, and 3, where the probabilities, corresponding probabilities are 0 0.5, 0 0.4, and 0 0.1. And you can say sample, I want 30 values. Sample values from x, I want 30 values, and use this vector of probabilities, 0 0.5, 0 0.4, 0 0.1 replace equals true, okay? And it produces the sequence, 2, 2, 3, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 2, so on and so forth. And, and basically, 1's produced with probability 0 0.5, 2's get produced with probability 0 0.4, and 3's get produced with probability 0 0.1, okay? And in fact, and I don't know 100% the internal workings of sample, but it is interesting to note that if I use the same starting seed, and I use the function that I wrote, random discrete, this function that I had written, we get the exact same results, okay? So internally, whatever R is doing, it's doing something very, very similar to what I've done, okay? Which is, because, uh, you know, if I give it the same kind of input vector, 1, 2, 3, and the probability vector, 0 0.5, 0 0.4, 0 0.1, it also produces the same sequence of values, 2, 2, 3, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? All right, I have run out of time, but that's okay. We'll start, we'll do the convolutions on Friday. So we'll look at convolutions on Friday. Let me give you your last view quiz answer for today. Last view quiz answer is the letter B, B as in bear. B as in bear is your last view quiz answer. So we'll end here. We'll, uh, we'll start off with the convolutions on Friday, and, uh, and we will see you then, okay? Have a good day, and we'll uh, see you later.